It's Tuesday, 9th of July, 1996. A warm summer afternoon near Chillenden, Kent, in the bucolic heart of the Garden of England. Her mother, Lynn Russell, her two daughters, Megan and Josie, and Lucy, their family dog, are making their way home after a swimming gala. They're following a route they've walked many times before. But today, they won't make it home. It's the beginning of one of the most controversial and tragic cases Britain has ever witnessed. Police are indicating that the questioning of this man could go into the weekend. He started to use drugs very early on. The media were in a frenzy about this. It's a violent assault and it involves a mum and her daughter. The determination, the callousness, the brutality of it. Killing the children, the killing of their mother, it was a horrific crime. So that does make me question, have they got the right man? I don't know if he did it or not. Levi Belfield has often been suspected of being the real perpetrator. I can categorically tell you, on the 9th of July, 1996, Levi Belfield never left my side. And when we got up to when we went to bed. Sean and Lynn Russell and their two daughters, Megan and Josie, lived in a quiet and idyllic part of Kent, close to Canterbury. Sean worked at the nearby university. Megan, six, and Josie, nine, attended primary school in the neighboring village of Goodniston. On a hot summer's afternoon in July 1996, Lynn walked the scenic route to collect her daughters from school. What we know about that day is that the two girls have been at a swimming gala in Canterbury and they got back to school just before four o'clock. They'd had a lift with a, another friend. Mum, Lynn, had walked across the fields to go and collect them with the dog. And as they've all come out of school, they've got their swimming bags, they've got their lunch boxes. And between them, they're carrying their stuff and they just set off to walk what would have been a 20 minute or so walk back home across the fields. They would have been walking home on their own um, with the dog, not expecting anything out of the ordinary to happen. We know that they've walked across the fields and they get to a five bar gate that leads out onto the lane where they cross over, and that's probably around 10 past four ish. Where they were walking is more or less a dirt track. There are hedgerows either side but it's way away from anything built up. As they walked along the lane, um, it's really hard then to understand what happens next. gets home 7, 7.30 in the evening. He's obviously expecting the, the girls to be at home. And when they're not there, he thinks it's a bit peculiar. By 9 p.m., Sean Russell is starting to get anxious. He takes a drive around the area to look for Lynn and the girls. At one point, he drives along Cherry Garden Lane. Perhaps the dog had run off and they were calling for it. Perhaps somebody had tripped over and twisted their ankle or, you know, there's a whole myriad of things that may have happened that would have been a logical explanation for them not coming home. But you can imagine, can't you, how scared he must have been? Having had no joy in finding them, he goes back and rings the police. Of course, then the police go to the house, getting there about half past ten at night. The police start their search of the area. The natural thing then is to actually walk the route that they know they had taken from school to home. It's midnight now, so it's pitch black. There's no street lamps around. All you've got is your torch. It's a very rural area. And of course, at that point, um, the officer is looking in the cops and comes across the three bodies. And to all intents and purposes, they all appear to be dead. 
The bodies of Lynn, Megan and Josie Russell are first spotted at around 12.16 a.m. There is no sign of life. At 1.30 a.m., a police officer and police surgeon enter the cops to examine the bodies. The officer makes a surprising discovery. As they look across at Josie, they can see actually that her chest is moving now. She's alive, she needs medical assistance immediately. The officer carries her out. Her arms and legs are flailing around and he's obviously trying to console her. And the same officer that thought the child was dead, you know, an hour earlier, is there the one desperately trying to keep her alive. Just before 2 a.m. on Wednesday, July 10th, Josie Russell arrives at hospital. She has suffered extensive head injuries. As doctors fight to save her life, police continue work at the scene. During the course of the night, you'd want minimal disruption because you can't see a lot of what's happening. And you'll be amazed how quickly dawn comes. As the sun rises, the police are able to begin their investigation of the scene. Over 12 hours have passed since the attack. I was working for BBC Radio Kent. On that particular morning, I was doing a news reading shift. If you do a news reading shift, there are certain uh, routines that you go through. You go in and you phone the fire brigade, the ambulance service and the police. There's a, a police press tape and on it was the report of this terrible murder. I had to sort of digest the information and then call it again and jot down the details so that I could write the story up and clearly run it as my top story. So we know that at about 8.30 the following morning, a key witness is seen by the police. And this key witness goes on to explain to the police that he had been out walking the previous afternoon and he's seen a man standing by a car with the boot open, which he just thought was a bit unusual. And when he goes back again to check, the car's gone and the man's gone, but he then discovers the, the bag which is the swimming bag, and it's got the towels that have been torn up in it that are heavily bloodstained. The witness describes the man he saw as aged 35 to 40, with light-coloured hair, driving a beige car. The blood on the towels and bag is the victim's, so this is a definite sighting of the killer. It's now a race against time for the police to identify him. It's now midday, and almost 20 hours have passed since the brutal attack, which left Lynn and Megan Russell dead and Josie Russell fighting for her life. Forensic examinations of the scene are underway. At around midday, head of forensic investigations, Jim Fraser, arrives at the scene. When I arrived there, of course, there was a lot of police there. I'm trying to kind of prepare myself mentally for uh, you know, what, how I'm going to investigate this, how I'm going to make sense of it. When it's a violent assault, as it was in this case, so it's a very bloody scene, and it involves a mum and her daughter, the emotional impact of what you're looking at is always significant. But of course, on one side, it's a bright, warm, summer, sunny day. You know, there's a kind of ripe cornfield on my right-hand side, kind of swaying in the wind. And on the left side, there was a kind of circle of trees and in that space were the two bodies. Investigators always hope forensic experts will be able to give them a clear idea of what happened and who the perpetrator might be. But this scene was challenging. The difficulty with this scene is that there were no even surfaces. It was plants and loose soil and vegetation and, and branches all lying around. When I looked at the ivy around one of the bodies to try and confirm what would have been a radio pattern emanating from where the blow was, I found that the, there was no pattern because the ivy had moved position because it follows the line of the sun during the course of the day. It quickly becomes clear that collecting forensic evidence in this isolated rural environment will be extremely difficult. Most murders are of single people. They are often in houses or in commercial premises. No one in the investigation team had encountered anything like this before. Can the forensic team find clues about how the crime was committed, and most importantly, by whom? But there was two bodies and there was another four pools of blood, so one of the questions was, well, 
have these bodies been moved. There were other pools of blood and there was a separate pool of blood which I was told that that's where Josie was found. A dog was killed as well. But not far from the scene, a potentially vital and highly unusual clue is discovered. They discover about 40, 45 metres away from the actual cops from the scene, a boot lace. The ligature that was used around Megan's neck, when you start comparing the marks on her neck, then that could be attributed as potentially being used as the ligature to put around her neck. It's a really important find. Desperate to find the man responsible for this heinous crime, the police appeal to the public for information. We'd like to hear from anybody who was out uh, at the time, and really we're talking from four o'clock to sort of one o'clock in the morning. Were you walking in this area? Were you in Nonningson Village? Were you at, uh, in the vicinity of the school? Did you th see anything suspicious? We'd like anybody to come forward. On the evening of July 10th, the post-mortems of Lynn and Megan Russell conclude that, like Josie, they had both suffered extensive head injuries caused by severe repeated blows from a blunt instrument, possibly a hammer. I went back to the scene on the 11th of July. By this time, wider searches had been done by the CSIs who were there, and they'd found blood on the track adjacent to where the bodies were found. What had been found was blood stains in what I would call a drip pattern. What that tells you is a couple of potential things. Somebody has been either standing there bleeding and the blood is dripping from them, or possibly that they're dripping from a weapon. This important detail could help identify the attacker. If it was dripping from a weapon, the most likely explanation is that it's the victim's blood. But someone who is bleeding might not be the victims, it could be an offender. When the blood on the track was analysed, it was established that it, that it matched Lynn. Although the blood doesn't identify a suspect, it does tell the forensic team something important. What I could then conclude in relation to all of the blood patterns was that the attack had begun on the track before the victims were moved into the, into the cops and then killed. One of the early difficulties in the case was trying to establish what might have been a motive in this case. And of course, some people believe there could have been a sexual motive and, and therefore we would have to look for evidence of, of, of a sexual crime. One of the ways you can detect seminal fluid is to shine a UV light on it because it fluoresces, but you can only see that in darkness. So on the night of the 11th, we went back to the scene to search it for semen. We did find a lot of fluorescent stains, but when we looked at them in, in, in normal light, they were plainly not semen. With the motive of the attack unclear, and with no positive identification of the man in the beige car who was spotted close to the victim's bloodied towels, over the coming months, the trail starts to go cold. By the spring of 1997, Josie Russell, now 10 years old, is making remarkable progress in her recovery, a year after the brutal attack in which her mother and sister were killed. Early indications were that, uh, that if she survived at all, she would survive in a, in a very diminished condition because she, she had suffered serious brain damage. It was unlikely that she would ever make a full recovery. Two things I've seen where people survive extreme injuries like that and head injuries like that is the resilience and willpower of the victim that we never know or understand is something that's obviously there inside them, they want to live. And the other thing that I've seen alongside it is the power of love and care of family. And just really, they seem to be present with them with an absolutely overriding conviction that they're going to get better. As it turns out, mercifully, she has made a, a recovery which exceeded early expectation. Once Josie has recovered sufficiently, police are keen to speak to her about the incident. They have to be sensitive to the trauma she's experienced. Using a specially built model of the crime scene with small dolls to represent those present, they help to piece together what happened on the day of the attack. It gives them greater insight into the sequence of events, 
but doesn't lead to a positive identification of the killer. One year on, it appears the man in the beige car is no closer to being found. Generally, in 24 hours, I would say in 90% of cases, you know who it is. The police are pretty good at finding a good suspect early doors, even if they don't have the evidence to arrest and charge. But there's still no clear suspect. There's nobody there out there who's been identified at this point. They don't know who's done it. The first anniversary of the crime in 1997 offers a fresh opportunity, and Kent police turn to the BBC's Crime Watch for help. I remember the Crime Watch appeal going out, so I suppose I was faintly optimistic that something might come from this. There was a reconstruction, and what I remember from that reconstruction is stressing on its rural setting. It's unusual for Crime Watch, you don't normally see that. We're down with the nitty gritty in the inner city, usually with crime watch reconstructions, but here was something very different. One of the eyewitnesses who had seen a man in the beige car driving away from the scene helped police to produce an e-fit. It is this e-fit shown on crime watch that gives the police their most significant lead in the case so far. She had seen him in his mirror and she was concerned that he seemed to be quite angry. Um, she then created a, an EFIT picture of him. It was a picture of a, a round-faced man with blonde hair. Finally, as a result of the Crime Watch appeal, the police are given a name, Michael Stone. I do remember after, after many months, I think it might have even been after a year or more, uh, we got a call from the police and I went along and interviewed uh, Dave Stevens and I asked him the usual question, had he made any progress? He, he said, well, I might have some important announcements to make on that front fairly soon. It was seen by uh, Michael Stone's psychiatrist at the time who alerted the Kent police. So we know that a few days before the murder, Michael Stone visited the mental health care professionals and they were quite worried about his behavior, his level of agitation, and specifically his level of risk. He was making threats to kill his probation officer and his probation officer's family. And I think this is one of the reasons why those mental health care professionals had red flags flagged up. The Kent police, on the strength of that, um, got themselves a um, profiler who, who profiled Michael Stone and said, yes, he's, he's likely to be the man. Police are indicating that the questioning of this man could go into the weekend. That is, if they get permission from magistrates to detain him. Stone's arrest was, was, a, was an enormous story across the, the media. You know, this was clearly a monster. The crime was, uh, was so horrendous. The killing of children, the killing of their mother in this remote area. It was a horrific crime. And a year after the, 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 the murder, when Stone was actually arrested, um, this seemed to be an enormous relief. On a personal level, I was elated because I was hopeful that, uh, that, that the fear, the, the unease that had pervaded in the area might perhaps be laid to rest. Kent is often referred to as the Garden of England, and the area around Chillenden typifies the bucolic beauty and quiet charm of the county. But 40 miles away, in the Medway region of Kent, a group of coastal towns, which have faded from a once affluent and busy naval past, lie on the estuary of the river Medway. During the 1980s, in stark contrast to the picture postcard villages of rural Kent, these gray forgotten towns had a very different story to tell. The Medway towns had traditionally been, been boom areas, you know, this was where the, uh, the Royal Dockyards were, there were a lot of jobs here, and there were a lot of very skilled, well-paid jobs here as well. Um, that changed in, in the 1980s. Uh, the, the dockyards were closed down. 20,000 people were put out of work. It resulted in 16% unemployment in the 1980s. The Medway towns in many ways started to resemble deindustrialised areas in other parts of Britain. And the result is unemployment. The spin-off of that is drugs, domestic violence and crime. And the Medway towns were no different in that respect. 
Anything that comes through Dover uh, makes its way to Fana and Medway first. Guns, drugs, people, everything comes across the channel and there's a lot of coastline. If you can afford to live in the nice part of Kent, then there are plenty of them. But uh, if you're in North Kent and Medway, then you know there's there, had, there hasn't been that much else to do uh, unless you're involved in criminality. Although we call it the, you know the, the Garden of England, there are pockets in Kent that have got the characteristics, all the characteristics that we associate with 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 the inner city and generating crime that we would see in the inner city. By 1996, Michael Stone was a resident of the Medway region, living in Gillingham, and had become involved in the local crime scene. There is a, a, clear, a, a clear link between uh, poverty, um, bad housing, violence, abuse, and crime and Michael Stone have been subjected to all of those things. When we look at Michael Stone's childhood and his adolescence, to me, it's just a picture of a very turbulent, chaotic lifestyle and environment. So we know that he's been charged with criminal offences at a very young age, as young as 11. On top of all of that, when we look at him in his later years, we know that he was quite a violent individual. He was also quite criminally versatile. He'd been arrested for a number of different charges, from assaults, to burglary, to robbery. So we really get the picture of somebody who's, who's quite disturbed, quite chaotic, and potentially could be quite prone to violence. He started to um, use drugs very early on, before, he's, before he even got into his teenage years, um, and was a heroin user by the time he was in his late teens. Multiple kinds of crimes, uh, burglaries, robberies, followed on. And also, he did show a penchant for, for violence as well. But he was someone who was, um, he was known to uh, the, the, the system. He was known to the care services. He was known to social services. He was known to the probation services. He was known to mental health services, drug services. Stone, Michael Stone was very much a product of this, this industri deindustrialized culture. By the time he was in his 30s, Michael Stone had been known to the police for over 20 years. Stone was obviously uh, known to police because of his uh, history of, of offending and also because he was a police informant. As an informant, uh, he was being paid small amounts of money, usually £50 a time, um, to give information on local crime, low-level stuff, nothing serious, nothing too dramatic, but he, he could keep his have it ticking over by providing this low-level information to the police. When we look at Stone's previous offending, we know that his first conviction for a very serious offence was in 1981, where he reportedly attacked a man with a mallet or a hammer, and he was charged with GBH and robbery. And then in 1983, he stabbed a man who was known to him in the chest. And then in 1987, he got sentenced for 10 years due to armed robbery. One interesting aspect to this case, in my view, is that we know that Michael Stone was a very heavy drug user. He spoke to some professionals and told them that he was spending about £100 a day on heroin and crack cocaine. There's a huge overlap with drug misuse, and often this drives offending. And there's a number of different forms and mechanisms. So in, in my clinical experience, I've certainly assessed many different offenders who have drug and alcohol issues and often their type of offence, specifically their level of violence, is far higher when they're intoxicated, when they're disinhibited, and when they're, when they're in that aggressive mindset than their baseline behaviour when they're relatively stable and sober. Police now have their prime suspect, though there is nothing concrete tying Stone to the crime. But the police are about to get a breakthrough that will change everything. It's September 1997. 14 months have passed since the horrific attack on Lynn Russell and her two daughters, from which only nine-year-old Josie survived. The only real suspect in the case is Michael Stone, but without a confession, positive witness identification, or DNA evidence, police are unable to charge Stone with the crime. Whilst he's in Canterbury Prison, he's put in the segregation unit, 
and it then becomes apparent that he's made a confession to a guy called Damien Daly. Daly discloses this confession to the prison staff who naturally call in the police to go and investigate. And from there, Damien's tale unravels about how they managed to communicate through the pipework, and he gives some key information that he says Stone has relayed to him. At that stage, Kent police are thinking, oh my God, here we go. It looks like we've got the right man now. More than two years after the murders, the trial of Michael Stone begins at Maidstone Crown Court. In addition to Damien Daly's account of Stone's confession, two more prison witnesses, Barry Thompson and Mark Jennings, have come forward with statements which appear to support the confession. There is also circumstantial evidence which supports the prosecution case. So October 1998, we're talking, what, nearly two and a half years since the actual murders and the attempt murder, and the police are now trial ready. And to be trial ready for any homicide is difficult. To be trial ready for a category A, one that you know is going to be in the national spotlight, they will have dotted every I and crossed every T. They've got the alleged confession that he's made to Daly. They've got the two disclosures made to two other prisoners. So they go into court with a circumstantial case, which is hard, but they feel like they've got a good, strong case. Well, you couldn't fail to notice how important it was because of the number of people that were there every day. And you couldn't fail to feel the drama and the, the whole thing and the atmosphere. A key obstacle that the prosecution needs to overcome is the lack of forensic evidence linking Stone to the crime. So Michael Stone was charged with the offence and his trial began in October 1998. And I gave evidence. My evidence was reasonably straightforward because I, I didn't really have any evidence that incriminated Michael Stone. My evidence was about what happened at the crime scene, the fact that the, the bodies had been moved and, and so on. And I was taken through it very skillfully by the barrister who was, who was prosecuting the case. Lawyers frequently use a description when, when describing circumstantial evidence to a jury of what they call the smoking gun. A man walks into a room and he sees another man holding a smoking gun and a dead body in, on, on the floor. And that's what's called circumstantial evidence. It doesn't have to be weak evidence. Um, it can sometimes be very powerful evidence, but it's usually an inference. In the early stages of the trial, some begin to question the accepted narrative. Stone's use of the hammer or the attacker's use of the arm was described as a frenzied attack. The frenzied nature of it is clear in the number of blows and the brutality of it. But everything else around the scene shows that this incident must have taken quite a few minutes. So the, the idea that, it, that it's frenzied from start to finish just doesn't work. There are so many different conflicting ideas of what could have happened because of the way the scene looks. Whoever it was must have been there for a long time. They had to get the mum and the girls and the dog to where they were eventually killed. He had to get them to cooperate. And then whatever happens after as well. Despite the lack of forensic evidence, a physical exhibit was used to support the circumstantial case, a bootlace found near the scene. A bootlace was found at the, at the scene of the at the scene of the murder, and um, the allegation was that this had been used as a as a tourniquet by a heroin addict to use to tighten the tighten the veins and make the, the vein protrude. And of course, Michael Stone is is a heroin addict. The only eyewitness to the murders was Josie Russell, the sole survivor. Despite her horrific injuries, she had been able to give police interviews, videos of which are used in the trial. One of the many unique things about this trial was that Josie Russell was able to give evidence. Getting a first-hand account of how this happened, or as much as she could remember, um, it was very dramatic in court. It was very dramatic. It was an emotional day in court when that was played. One of the prosecution's main strategies is to expose lies they claim Michael Stone had told the police, including his denial of carrying a hammer in his car and his familiarity with that particular part of Kent. Stone claimed 
not to have any knowledge of the area at all, but it was actually found out that he was um, at one point in a children's home. So he knew something of the area, but he was only there for a very short period of time. Well, one of the agreed facts that was admitted before the jury was that a uh, former friend of Michael Stone had driven around the area with him and indeed um, uh, Michael Stone had directed him showing knowledge of the area. It should also be noted that he was, he, he was around the area. Allegedly, he was looking for sheds, outbuildings, burglaries of, of homes as well. And he had come quite close to the Chillington area, to the spot where the, where the Russell family were, 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 were murdered. So he did know something of the area. The prosecution also puts forward the evidence of two former associates of Stone, who claimed to have seen him in the period following the attack. The prosecution estimated that this was on the day after the murders, July 10th. However, under cross-examination, one of these witnesses was proven to be unreliable. There was some questionable evidence from a couple who said that they'd seen Michael Stone with blood over him on his clothing. Uh, that evidence was contradicted. And there was a police officer who saw him that day uh, and described him as being clean-shaven and clean and tidy. Stone also had a meeting with a member of the mental health team who also made no mention at all of Blundstein's clothing. After stating Michael Stone's denial of certain claims made against him, the defence team has to decide whether the accused should enter the witness box. The defence have done their job during the prosecution case of trying to knock it down. If they don't have an alibi, if they don't have supporting witnesses for that alibi, the only other thing that you can do is put the defendant in the box. Stone was never a candidate, really, for going in the witness box. The jury retires to deliberate its verdict. Two years of complex police investigation is about to be over. In all honesty, I, I really wasn't sure which way it would go, because on the one hand, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence um, tying him to the case, and there was the uh, statement by Mr. Daly uh, indicating that uh, he had made a confession in prison. So I, on the day, I waited the, um, the verdict with what you might term bated breath. Although it hasn't reached a unanimous verdict, the jury does eventually return with its decision. It's always, it is a tense moment when, when you know that the jury's come back with a verdict. Stone looked engaged. Um, from what I remember, he was engaged in the process. And that was, that was definitely firmed up when uh, the jury came back with their verdict by his reaction. The jury, with a 10 to 2 majority, finds Michael Stone guilty. Packed courtroom. And then when the verdicts are announced, Stone reacts. He jumped up and he shouted and, you know, he was restrained and it was one of the more uh, outspoken or vocal reactions I've seen in, in a trial. I don't think he was expecting it. As far as the verdict was concerned, it was surprising because um, uh, certainly from the defence point of view, we took the view that the evidence was pretty slim, um, especially because most of it was based on Damien Daly's um, purported cell confession. So the result was a surprise. The prosecution has secured its verdict the case appears to have been solved. I have no doubt I've been able to hear a pin drop in that court. And when those words come out for the first indictment, because obviously there's a number of indictments guilty, uh, the relief there for those officers and the family will be enormous. And it is relief rather than elation at that stage, because you say, oh, we've done it. We've done the right thing. So relief, then elation. But celebrations were short-lived. Within days of the verdict, a revelation in the media shocked the nation. The day after the trial which convicted Michael Stone for the murders of Lynn and Megan Russell and the attack on nine-year-old Josie Russell, a bombshell was dropped by one of the witnesses, Barry Thompson. That day of relief and elation from guilty verdicts is really short-lived because 24 hours later, a key witness one of those who says that there's been a disclosure by Stone in prison has then said, actually, I've lied. A fellow called Thompson, 
who said that he had heard Stone effectively making some sort of confession in the exercise area. Um, well, at the end of that trial, told the press that he'd told a pack of lies. The Hampshire police then uh, conducted an inquiry on the Kent police's investigation and three years later they decided that there was nothing untoward about the Kent police investigation. Thompson's evidence was meant to have supported the prosecution's main argument that Stone had boasted of the murders to other prisoners. Today's allegations can only strengthen the claims that Stone's conviction was unsafe. Absolute devastation. Your whole case, everything that you've worked so hard to protect the integrity of, to get it to court and do the right thing, is suddenly blown out of the water. With Thompson's evidence discredited, the man who'd always claimed he was innocent won leave to appeal. Barry Thompson's retraction of his earlier evidence was the reason why they overturned the conviction and, he w and, and Stone was able to appeal. The appeal judges will decide Stone's fate on Thursday. The Crown will press for a retrial, but Stone's lawyers will argue he should be released immediately because the publicity surrounding him would make a fair hearing impossible. The outcome of Stone's appeal was that there would be a retrial. The defence had pushed for dismissal of the case. Uh, one of the reasons they, want, they said it should be dismissed was because of the, the level of publicity throughout the country and that everyone knew about the case. The judges in this instance, if you like, avoided that possible uh, bias of jurors by moving the retrial. It was moved to Nottingham, which is about 170 miles away from the, the first trial. So different jury, different location. The idea being that it could be independent of any previous judgment. Court of Appeal said um, that, um, in fact, it was three years before, and people all have forgotten about it, and they sent us up to Nottingham, where they said nobody will um, have remembered it. And indeed, the, the jury didn't seem to remember the case when they were asked about it um, before they were caught and before the end panel. I guess when I knew there was going to be a retrial, I, I just sort of thought, this case is never going to end. The evidence against Stone is very slim, it's circumstantial, and if anything, the evidence at the, at the retrial is going to be even less evidence than was at the first trial. But my job was to, was to keep going. You know, again, because of the technology, because the DNA technology was continually moving, I was continually reviewing the case. I was continually in discussions with Dave Stevens, the, the SIO, about what anything else that can be done to review these findings. It was, it, it, it just was never let go. On the 5th of September, 2001, Stone's retrial began at Nottingham Crown Court. Barry Thompson's supporting evidence was no longer a part of the case, and the evidence of Mark Jennings was also excluded, leaving only Damien Daly's testimony of Stone's cell confession and the circumstantial case. Although we'd been reviewing the case, there was no other new evidence, no, certainly no other new forensic evidence was used in the retrial. The defence raised questions about the cell confession. We were also not happy that it was possible to hear Michael Stone through those pipes. So much so that in fact, um, when, when in the second trial, uh, we all were travelled down from Nottingham Crown Court to Canterbury Prison. And the jury, the, the, the judge, the, the, the lawyers, everybody, and we um, we listened to a sound expert who sat in the stone, the, the, the cell that Michael Stone had been in, reading Harry Potter, and the jury trooped in and out of the other of Damien Daly's cell to see if they could hear him reading Harry Potter at different volumes. It was there was something surreal about it, I have to say. It turns out that, in fact, the jury could hear um, the, the sound expert um, reading Harry Potter in the cell next door. As the retrial drew to a close, the judge advised the jury that the case stood or fell on the testimony of Damien Daly. If they believed that he was telling the truth, then Stone was a guilty man. But if they didn't believe him... High-profile cases inevitably um, 
put the jury under quite a lot of pressure. They're going to be concerned about getting the right verdict and, and inevitably the jury are going to think to themselves, if we acquit and he's the man, then that's all, that's, nothing can be done about it. Of course, they might be thinking to themselves, if we convict, then uh, if it's the wrong man, the Court of Appeal might sort it out. Michael Stone arrived at court this morning hoping he'd be a free man by the end of the day. But after nearly 11 hours of deliberations, the jury found him guilty on three counts of murder. I was very surprised that he was found guilty a second time because the second jury had even less to go on than the first one. Um, you know, and the, the first jury, they're all from Kent, obviously, they're all taken from the local area, so you, you know, uh, it's like boxing, it's a hometown decision. So to get a retrial because one pillar of the evidence to convict has collapsed, uh, and to get, a, to get a second conviction on that when, when the case is even weaker was very surprising, yeah. I was half expecting the conviction to be overturned, really, because um, when the judge directed that the, the whole case stood or fell on Damien Daly, that seemed to be uh, a relatively insubstantial um, pillar on which to stand an entire conviction. And I thought perhaps that that might not be enough. The second trial is over. But has an innocent man been wrongly convicted for a second time? Twenty-five years on, Michael Stone is still in jail for the Russell murders. This case continues to generate fierce debate, both online and in the national media. That debate includes the arguments and evidence introduced in court and questions about conclusive proof of Stone's guilt and his motive for the crime. One key weakness of the case still remains. There is no forensic evidence against Michael Stone. So we had carried out extensive and detailed forensic examinations over the course of something like 18 months, but, but there was no forensic evidence to connect Michael Stone with that crime. As far as the forensic evidence is concerned, normally there's a principle that um, any, any, any person involved in a crime will leave DNA at, at, the, at the crime, will leave some sort of forensic evidence at the crime scene. But no DNA was found, no, no forensic evidence was found that linked Michael Stone to that crime scene. There were some question marks because there were some hairs at the scene um, that didn't belong to Stone or to the three victims. Um, you remember that Stone wasn't identified until very late on as a suspect, so none of his clothing at the time was ever seized. So those opportunities to examine it weren't present. And the car um, that was at the scene and that would have been used by the offender was never identified. So all those forensic opportunities were never available. So forensically, linking him to the scene was a non-starter. The prosecution has always maintained that the lack of forensic evidence is not an issue because of the testimony of Damien Daly and what they claim is the weight of the circumstantial case against Stone. To begin with, there is the lack of an alibi. Stone didn't have an alibi. He couldn't say where he was. We know that Stone was in a pawn shop in Chatham at lunchtime, and that's the only physical location confirmed for him on the day. And it's still an hour's drive from there to Chillenden. The Kent police answered that by saying that there was still time for him to have gone from Chatham to Canterbury, uh, driven there and back. Um, it, it was quite tight, but it was just about possible, I think. But others point to the lack of motive. If you look at Stone's criminal record, um, you can see that some of the violence that he committed was, they were crimes of anger. Revenge, someone had upset him, someone had done something, and he, he lashed out at them. Or they were crimes that he was gonna get a return for. 
it's hard to see the Russell murders actually fitting in with his strategies in the past. It just doesn't fit. Stone had an admitted violent past. He'd taken out um, retribution against people who thought he thought I'd wronged them. But to go from that to to this is a big leap. <laughs> to carry through with these attacks, the will to do that sets you apart from anybody else in society. The determination, the callousness, and the brutality of it requires a real will and I don't know that Stone is really, I don't know that he really fits that. Could robbery have been the intention? We do know from uh, Josie's evidence that uh, the, 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 the killer had asked the, um, had asked the mother for, for money. There's no other evidence at all to suggest that this was a a robbery. Indeed, there was a necklace left behind, which is a, something quite petty and probably not worth very much, but to a heroin addict, presumably that would have been worth something, and that was left. Not somewhere that you would expect him to habitually go to, because if you have that kind of lifestyle, you're generally on the hunt for your next fix. Being out in the middle of nowhere is not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to get you very far. It was always confusing as to why he would be there. There's no quick access to easy money for him there. There's no robbery. He's got nothing to gain from this. Why would he be there? I think what happened with this case was that there was so much pressure on the police to get a result. And that pressure came from the general public, driven by the tabloids of the, of the time, who were a very, very powerful force in British society. When they got stunned, when they got a, a, a suspect, when they got a, a, a drug adult, adult murderer, they were going to put him away one way or another. And they, and they did, and I understand why they did that. Then there's the notion that his drug use could have led to the attacks. So when we look at the, at the connection between Michael Stone's drug use and these murders, there's a couple of different possibilities. It could be that he was actually intoxicated and using drugs heavily at the time, which would make him less inhibited and would make him more likely to commit violence. Or it could be that he was relatively sober at that moment in time, but was going through withdrawals and felt quite desperate for money. So it was almost like he would do anything that he had to do just to be able to, to get some money for his next fix. It's not the kind of behavior you would expect from somebody who uh, has a a real preoccupation with, with finding their next fix, so... Um, no, he didn't really... I didn't think he really fit the profile, but... Uh, he was the guy that the police had in the frame for it. One key piece of evidence, the bootlace, was used to create a link between Stone and the murder case. Not a physical one, backed up by his DNA, but a circumstantial one. No DNA evidence was actually found on the, on the bootlace. None of it could be linked to stone, uh, but nonetheless, the idea that it was a tourniquet and not a bootlace was constantly stressed by the prosecution, which linked the bootlace to Michael Stone. So the stress on tourniquet rather than bootlace is, is key there despite the fact that there was no DNA evidence actually found on it. If that was the killer's tourniquet, why have we not found the killer's DNA on it? Because it is very puzzling not to find uh, DNA on an item that ha would have been repeatedly used by an individual. And even, if, even if it was used as a bootlace and not a tourniquet, I would still expect to find a DNA on it. It's not that that never happens, but it's still very unusual. Stone's violent past is undeniable, but does that mean he's capable of the level of brutality in this crime? When we look at Stone's previous offending, even though there were very serious offences, you know, everything up to armed robbery, 
from stabbing somebody to different forms of assault, it's still a very big leap from that level of violence to go to a triple homicide. And of course, there are the key sightings of a beige car seen on the day of the attack. Great significance was placed on this evidence, yet this beige car has never been found. So there are a number of eyewitnesses who described particularly a beige car. There was the woman who drove behind the vehicle, she said, was, uh, had come out of the, the area um, with an angry man in it. The, the woman who followed the car um, in the area, who made the EFIT picture, was following a beige car. Two witnesses described seeing Stone driving a variety of different coloured cars, including beige, but the car that Stone owned at the time was a white Toyota Tercel. The other commonality from the eyewitnesses was a, a beige car. The existence of a, of a beige car um, kept on coming up. The car he was driving at the time was a white car. The, the evidence is poor. The so-called eyewitnesses, it, it doesn't work for Stone. Of course, the case against Stone doesn't solely rely on circumstantial evidence. There is the testimony of former prisoner Damien Daly, their key witness, who alleged Stone had confessed to him. But other prison witnesses had proven unreliable and did not form part of the prosecution case. He was purported to have made confessions to um, people who later turned out to have made those confessions up. And this concerned him so much that he asked to be put into segregation um, because it, he didn't want to, um, to have that evidence effectively made up against him. Stone is aware that, that his, his story is in, in, the, in the press and, and he, he feels vulnerable. So he asked to go into segregation. If you've asked to be segregated because he think you're going to be a target of attack and also because you think that you're possibly going to be uh, the target of um, stories or anything made up by other prisoners, of course you're going to ask to be segregated and it's highly unlikely that you're going to try and speak to anybody. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to confess, it's unlikely that you're going to speak to anybody at all. It's even more unlikely that you're going to use a pipe that you don't know where it goes and you, how you would know that your voice is going to carry through to the next cell or, you know, is he just talking to himself? It was stated at trial that all details in the alleged confession that Daly described were facts that were in the public domain or could have been deduced from facts in the public domain. If there is doubt from some regarding the veracity of the alleged confession, it begs the question, why would Daly lie? It is a great myth that the criminal community abide by a code of honour and don't speak to the authorities and don't graft. That's a myth. Most of them do, particularly at the lower levels. And this particular man, Damien Daly, claims that Michael Stone admitted to the killings via the heating pipes of the prison. The benefit to someone like Damien Daly would be that uh, the prison authorities would look uh, favourably upon them in the future. Uh, they may get some reduction in their sentence. Um, that they may have, have some kind of uh, feeling of revenge against someone else. Uh, and also, let's not forget how serious this crime was. Children were killed. Children were murdered. Um, in, in prison parlance, this was a nonce case. So who knows why he did it, but all of those are possibilities. If the confession is false and Stone is innocent, who is the murderer? One name that has come up regularly over the years in potential connection with the Russell murders and as an alternative to Michael Stone is that of Levi Belfield. So Levi Belfield is a really interesting character, isn't he? We, you know, he's a known serial killer, uh, um, multiple offender on many levels. I started a relationship with Levi when he was working at Rocky's nightclub in Cobham in Surrey. He'd been pestering me to go out for a drink for a few weeks and I kept saying no. And then one night I was outside and I was having a cigarette and he asked me again if I wanted to go for a drink and I caved and agreed. When I first met him, he was lovely. 
you couldn't ask for a nicer person. He bought you flowers, presents, took you to nice places, treated you really well. Yeah, he was what you'd call a perfect boyfriend. Bearing in mind who Levi Belfield is and what he has done, bringing his name into it, yeah, I mean, he'd fit the profile more than Stone does. At the start, the relationship was good for the first couple of months, and then he just flipped one night and the real Levi came out. For some reason, he got the ump about something and just beat the living crap out of me. His answer was he was really upset, he was really sorry, it was because he'd never fallen in love with someone like he had fallen in love with me, and the usual rubbish that they tell you, and of course you believe it. Le Levi Belfield has, has, has become really one of the great monsters of, of the early 21st century. Crimes against women, uh, violence against women, um, again, very much part of a violent, low-level criminal underworld. People know him, people who know very little about crime know about Levi Belfield. So the crimes that he's committed were, were, were really indicative of the next phase of uh, serious criminality, serious violence that the public became concerned with after the Chillington killings. There were so many different things that he'd flip out over. They all become one. You know, it could be you didn't cook the right dinner, you didn't empty an ashtray, you didn't do something, bed wasn't made right, it could be anything or nothing. On top of the terrible violence and abuse Belfield inflicted on Joe, she started to become suspicious of his activities in the outside world. There was a bin liner in my, da in my garage and it had one of my dad's old, you know, like the big donkey jackets. Um, that had the inside pocket cut out and there was a knife in there and a magazine that he'd slashed all the faces of the blondes. If I remember rightly, it had a bag of clover in it as well. I always called it his rape kit. He used to go out in the alleyway behind my house that runs from Strawberry Hill train station to um, Shacklegate Lane, which is about a mile and a half long and he used to go and wait for people that had come off the trains. And I know I'll get all the, why didn't you report him to the police? Why didn't you say this? Why didn't you do that? Live with him. Be in my situation and live with him and then tell me why you haven't reported him. I was terrified of him. I mean, some people have said to me, oh, you're so lucky he didn't kill you. He would never have killed me. You know, all the beatings and the rapes at home was just practice for him for when he went out and did it. And he couldn't kill us because it's, you know, it's too close to home. Levi Belfield's MO was uh, to attack women from behind and hit them with a blunt instrument. It's probably fair to say that Belfield's MO and his, his history uh, it gels with this, this offence. It is possible to consider him being uh, the perpetrator. So Levi Belfield's MO is really interesting, isn't it? Because he likes to attack strangers. He definitely has a penchant for hammer attacks. He doesn't always commit sexual offences when he commits violent crime. Belfield initially denied any involvement with the Russell murders, but his story has changed over the years. Levi Belfield has often been suspected of being the real perpetrator of the horrific murders against the Russells. And there is a connection in that his MO was very similar, hitting his victims over the head with a blunt object. Belfield, of course, initially, I think in 2017, uh, denied anything to do with the murders then said later on that he had driven around the area uh, and recently has produced a four-page document asserting that he was indeed the murderer and giving details of that murder. A number of eyewitness accounts from the original murder inquiry had focused on the perpetrator driving a beige car and claims have been made that Belfield could have borrowed his partner Joe's beige car. So there's a, another woman who is also a really important witness and she describes seeing her car um, at the junction of Buckland Lane and Station Road, so just about quarter to five. And the description she can give of this car is that it's beige in colour. And she talks about it being a bit like an Escort um, type model. 
uh, with a spoiler on the back and a GB stickers. We never had a beige hatchback, never. We did not own or drive a beige hatchback. I had a Sierra Sapphire at the time and it was like a opal, sort of pearl, ivory kind of colour. It had nothing like, no stickers, no fins, fans, spoilers, nothing like that. Another potential link to Belfield is what has been claimed as his apparent similarity to the man in the EFIT image. He always had black hair gelled back. Apparently, he dyed it blonde, but I don't ever remember it being blonde. I mean, it really wouldn't have suited him if he did, and if he did, it was probably for a couple of days because he would have had his arse ripped out of him for it because you don't go from being jet black to blonde. He had jet black hair. Jet black hair. You know, have you seen the picture of him when he sat on the floor in the check shirt? That is when we were together. That is exactly how he looked. But the biggest obstacle to accepting the truth of Belfield's alleged confession is Joe's recollection of his whereabouts on the day of the murders. So on the 9th of July, 96, it was my birthday. We got up in the morning. He actually made breakfast that day. We spent a little bit of time playing with the baby. Then we went to the stables to do my horse, which is, was in Windsor. He wouldn't let me get out the car to start off with because he had a surprise. And what he'd done is gone round to my stable and he'd tied some balloons to the door and he was so happy about it, you know. Oh, it was a lovely gesture, you know, it was really sweet. And one of my best friends was there and a couple of other friends on the yard. And we did the horse and potted about. And then he said about going for lunch across the road, which we did quite a lot. I even remember what I had because I always ate the same there. I always had, they did a really nice homemade lasagna and garlic bread. Um, then we went back to the stables, finished the horse off, went home, played with the baby again, had a bath, what have you, got changed and he took me out for dinner that night. We would have gone to dinner at about eight o'clock that night, but there's absolutely no way from when we got up to when we went to bed that he left my side or went anywhere bar putting the balloons on my horse's stable door that he could have driven to Kent, done what he says now that he did and what other people are saying that he did and came back without me knowing. It's an absolute impossibility. I can categorically tell you on the 9th of July, 1996, Levi Belfield never left my side from when we got up to when we went to bed. And it boils my piss to say it because I've always said, yes, he's done this, yes, he's done that, yeah, no, uh, yeah, yeah. But I can hand on my heart, guarantee you he did not do that. Belfield enjoys attention, that's absolutely clear, and this is by him um, confessing to the Chillingdon killings is a way of drawing attention to himself yet, yet again. I, I think one of the dangers here is that we look, to, we look closely at, at, at Levi Belfield rather than looking again at Michael Stone, because what we really need to know is, did Michael Stone commit this crime? Um, if he didn't, then we look elsewhere. Uh, but I think one of, the, one of the problems is if we concentrate too much on Belfield, it ignores Stone, and Stone has been in prison now for a very long time for a crime that he may not have committed. If Michael Stone did this, he was convicted on the most marginal of evidence, and, and I feel uncomfortable about that. I don't know if he did it or not, but I know that he didn't prove that he did it. He's always protested his innocence, which how many people go to prison and protest their innocence vociferously like that for all that time? Not many. So that does make me question, you know, have they got the right man or not? We're in Cherry Garden Lane. And in here, there was the two bodies that I saw, but originally three bodies found by the, by the police. 26 years after this crime happened, people are still arguing about this case. 
If Michael Stone didn't attack the Russell family here 26 years ago, and Levi Belfield didn't kill them, then the killer is still out there. someone you know has been affected by any of the issues raised in tonight's programme, please go to channel5.com slash helplines for information and support. More true crime next in Crimes That Shook Britain.